uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'd like to start by thanking uh, organizers for putting this meeting together, and special thanks both to Jamal and Kai for inviting me. Uh, I have to apologize. I took the liberty to change the title uh, a little bit, and this change of the title is actually not reflected in the, in the abstract. But, so uh, I'm going to talk about, obviously I'm going to put, unlike Chandler's talk, so I'm going to basically major emphasis will be on Samaria P6 and general topology will come this later. So, um, and I'm going to talk about transport and, uh, and uh, how Samaria P6 is, uh, is a super material. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the financial support of uh, uh, coming from the state of Ohio and um, DARPA. As well, sorry, Army Research Office, and as well the partial support from the uh, Max Planck Institute for Physics of Complex Systems. I think that. Uh, so I uh, would like to um, start by basically reviewing the theoretical concepts. I'm going to keep it very simple, um, as simple as possible. I should say, although actually, uh, idea is quite simple. So uh, it goes like this. In principle, uh, as we heard in Quant. Ohm's talk already is that basically the, the whole idea of topological complex solator is that we need to invert bands in the bulk. A bands must necessarily have uh, different parity. <laughs> so in bismuth based material, these are S and P bands. So the, the, uh, then the kind of continuing this logic, the question is uh, whether we can get the same physics, whether we can get this uh, trivial surface state coming out of the material which where T and <coughs> F bands invert. And, um, <coughs> The way you get that gap in this material in a more straightforward way is just through the particle counting. So if you have, say, high temperatures, uh, the D and F orbitals would be decoupled, so it will be a metal. Then at low temperatures, they will talk to each other. And if you have sort of a number of particles creating this even number of particles creating cells, so you sort of uh, did want us to have an insulator uh, with some disclaimers, which I don't really want to go to at this point. But uh, the, and then if you make D and D band model with the D band, electronic D band and the whole F band, then basically we guarantee, guarantee essentially to have the gaps across the whole brilliant zone. The price you pay for working with F orbitals is that uh, you this the localization of the F, the, the F electrons are predominantly localized, and this essentially means that your correlations are quite uh, big, and for F four shells or five shells here, you can estimate the, the size of the Coulomb repulsion there is on the level of on the, on the, of the rotor of two EV. Uh, the good thing is that uh, the spin orbit coupling, which typically need for the band inversion, is also quite sizable compared to the D, uh, D shell material. So, um, so far, it's just on qualitative, very, very qualitative level, so clearly there are something to, uh, to look for. So strong spin orbit coupling essentially and guarantee, will essentially guarantees the band inversion. Uh, how to deal with the Coulomb interactions we might think uh, we might think later, but just to put it now discussion in a more um, quantitative level, right? So to see whether indeed there is an effect, uh, we can start with something very simple. We can just forget, ignore completely uh, interactions, and think about the 2D model. And I well, the, the back of the envelope. Uh, here is the background is the reason. It's just again, it's just very sort of we're keeping it semi very qualitative and semi quantitative. So the idea is that you will put the conduction band, um, you put the alpha electrons, and then you couple them between each other. And the key point here is that um, is that this hybridization matrix element which couples them together is necessarily K dependent because when you couple D and F orbitals together, you sort of you transfer the angular momentum number and between D and F the difference is one. So it's in this case if I assume this is D and this is F, that would be linear in K. If I work with S and F, that will be cubic in K. But the important thing this is odd in momentum. Uh, the basis here is chosen as I said, so we have W degenerate primers and W degenerate F, just for simplicity. Uh, and so uh, for example, having D is and uh, going linear in momentum, it ties by the sign kx and sign ky. Uh, we immediately notice that this Hamiltonian is essentially equivalent to the Bernier Hughes and Jean uh, model. If we just choose the parameters carefully, so we can represent this Hamiltonian I showed in the previous transparency. 
as just basically consisting of two blocks, two two by two blocks <coughs> of Bernoulli-Q's jump, where m is just the minus quarter of the f, uh, f electron energy, and lambda here is just equalization. So and then you can basically put this on the on the uh, um, but this Hamiltonian is defined in the bulk, but now if we touch the surface and do the, band, uh, and do the uh, surface state calculation, then depending on the ratio of these parameters, uh, basically we either have an effect, so we have an in-gap state uh, with linear uh, momentum dispersion, or we basically don't, don't have anything. So there is something into it, and then, um, <clears throat> I don't know, when I teach, typically I, from time to time, I put the pictures of famous people for my students and I give them four versions to guess uh, who is that person. So I'm not going <laughs> to do it here. So this is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And uh, uh, I stumbled on, on, this, on this quote as I was preparing this talk. Uh, and the quote goes as follows. Uh, the world of imagination is boundless. The world of reality has its limits. And uh, the question is, <laughs> basically, put it uh, simply, is whether we can actually accommodate these ideas, which I discussed uh, a minute ago, in, in, uh, in, in reality, in realistic materials. So let's talk uh, Samarium B6, as uh, the conference is mostly devoted to this material. So cubic material, Samarium B6, um, mildly correlated. Uh, the effect is, again, we've seen this graph before, I'm sure we've seen it several times in the conference. Um, it's an insulator at low temperatures, and the, there is a saturation here below 5 Kelvin <coughs> or so. And uh, the, the thing is that we decided the correlation is that, of course, the temperature dependence on the susceptibility, right? So it has pronounced temperature dependence in the metallic region of temperatures, uh, and then it mostly sort of saturates. Uh, below certain temperature when the when basically material becomes insulated. So this is sort of very layman type of layman type of uh, discussion. Jim Allen in his tutorial yesterday actually gave much more depth to all of this data, but again I want to sort of keep it at this point uh, as, sim as simple as possible. <clears throat> so that's kind of the surface view from way way above what's happening. So the question is if this if this effect is due to the surface states, if this, this effect, uh, if this if the shoulder is due to the Dirac electrons on the surface, in other words, if the Samarium P6 is a topological insulator or not. So this is the topic of this conference. Um, the way I'm going to present now, I'm going to follow the discussion in my talk. Um, I'm just going to basically pose this question, how one can identify if the material is topological insulator, topological bond insulator, by just transferring measurements from a dynamics measurement. In the context of Samarium B6, um, we have this luxury and it, uh, that the fact that below 5 Kelvin, basically bulk, is uh, several papers from 2012 and later show that indeed the bulk becomes sort of insulating, right? So the only transport which happens there is on the surface. Thermodynamics here, by thermodynamics, I mostly refer to the quantum oscillation data. Uh, and so, if we want to address the physics here, so we at least need to address these four points, that the transport would be limited to the surface, then the time reversal symmetry breaking leads to localization, then there is a strong coupling, which means helicity, implies helicity for the Dirac surface states. And then number four, that we actually, the, the fact that the surface carriers have, has, uh, have Dirac spectrum. So at least if we can put check marks in front of the, all these four points, then more or less, at least to me, uh, will be convinced that indeed the materialism caused the topological surface state. Uh, those the, the, of course, the list, as Jim in the morning already showed the list of his questions, I think it can be made much longer, but sort of to me, is, this is a minimal program. So uh, what I would like to discuss today, <clears throat> and um, I think it will also help me to bring this uh, hanging question of the coexistence between the maybe trivial states and drug states, uh, in particular, so I'm going to discuss the, this the number three strong spin orbit coupling and helicity issue. And so uh, here goes my summary. So I'm going to talk about the theory of weak anti-localization of generally speaking quantum correction to conductivity in the surface of topological punitive topological condensator. Um, 
Uh, since we have experiments on this MP6, I will talk, of course, put it in the context of Somalia MP6. This is the first part of my talk. And um, <clears throat> in the second part of my talk, I'm going to switch gears a bit, and I'm going to talk about interaction. It's presumably, assuming that we have well-defined surface states with Dirac dispersion, so I will talk about uh, possible consequences of interaction effects. And here, my emphasis will be mainly on the fact that uh, as soon as you include interactions in the system, quite generally, you will get, uh, you will generate spatially inhomogeneous states. Simply speaking, you will necessarily generate the puddles of, of electronic density, and uh, and uh, in principle, that might lead to certain signatures in the experiments, such as quasi-one-dimensional transport and things uh, like that. Uh, and certainly, in principle, it should be proved. It should. It can be proved also by STM. But the, again, the main point I would like to make that the surface, even for weak interactions, the surface is prone to generating spatially spatially inhomogeneous states. All right. Uh, so let me start with the first one: quantum correction to conductivity. So uh, let me just remind you uh, uh, first qualitatively. So what I'm going to talk about. So the physics of the processes which I'm going to describe is the uh, basis on the, is based on the following observation. So we're looking for the scattering of quasi-particles from the state k to the state with the momentum uh, minus k. So it's a backscattering. In principle, the point is that you can go from k to minus k through two paths, right? One will go, in this picture I'm showing it, kind of going counterclockwise from k to k1, k2, k3, minus k, but you can might as well go clockwise. Here, K3 prime, K2 prime, K1 prime. And so the propagation of electrons along both of these uh, paths will be uh, independent. But at the end, when they, when they sort of arrive to the, to, the, to the state with minus K, they interfere. And for that, uh, uh, clearly you, have, you need uh, that the phase for the electrons to interfere you need that the phase coherence time, the time when the electrons actually lose their phase, to be fairly long. At least much longer than the transfer time is getting. This is what this is my implicit assumption here. And it turns out that you get the following correction to conductivity. Here I'm showing conductance, but the point is it's negative. They interfere always destructively. In this simple picture and this in two dimensions, this correction to conductivity is actually logarithmic. Uh, under the log, we will have, we have the phase coherence time, which is temperature dependent, temperature dependent, I'm sorry, and the transport time is temperature independent. This is the two pioneering papers by Erika Abrahams and collaborators in 2009, and also Larkin, Berkov, and Klonitsky also uh, published the, basically did the same thing in, in around the same time. Uh, uh, the scattering time, as I mentioned, is temperature dependent. Typically, this exponent is between one and two. If it's less than one, that usually means a ballistic transport. But again, I want to make another comment that uh, I'm not going to do the theory of tower five, basically. Here. So I'm going to assume, I'm going to change, just take it as a parameter. Uh, and there's a side comment, since there are a lot of young people in the audience, actually, there is no theory for the phase coherence time of, in heavy fermion uh, materials, or whatever you want. <clears throat> All right, so this in fact, this correction to conductivity is called weak uh, localization simply because the conductivity drops as the temperature goes down. Um, in topological insulators, things are different. And uh, so here I'm showing my previous plot, but I'm showing it in a diagrammatic way. Again, I'm going one way from k to minus k, I'm going in the, long, the opposite path from k to minus k. These daggers here are the impurities in which I scatter. Uh, the point is that in topological insulators, when the electron goes Around the impurity, there are two options again to go one way here or another way, time reverse path. It basically spin rotates by diabatically by pi and minus pi, so the total phase difference will be two pi. And at the end, and because of that, uh, the, the actually there is a destructive interference. That is, you don't basically get localization, you get anti-localization. In other words, when you decrease the temperature, so you increase your tau phi, your conductivity actually grows. And not, uh, does, and not it does not decrease. And this has a name. It goes in the name of the weak anti localization. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> when you put now the system in magnetic field, uh, if you have anti localization, what field does? Field kind of um, breaks this 
uh, ideal localization. So if you look at the correction, to uh, you, you basically at magneto conductivity, but you take it relative to the correction at zero field, you find that this correction becomes basically negative. And so this is the typical plots, and uh, this is the usually experimentally used this result from uh, Hikami Larkin Nagaoka, which basically in, 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 which studied magneto conductivity for uh, for the two-dimensional electron gas with, with disorder with large spin orbit coupling versus small spin orbit coupling. But there is this parameter alpha. Generally, its sign depends again on the, on the many parameters, many scattering process in the system, it can be positive or it can be negative. So when it's positive, then basically we can the localization and the correction has the following typical dependence on the magnetic field. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> uh, another important thing I would like to emphasize in principle, this is an orbital effect, so the field, we look at the field perpendicular to the plane, so if you put the field in the plane, you should have, ideally you don't have an effect at all. Okay, so now let me just review quickly two experiments which have been done in Samari MP6, which observe, in fact, the kind of localization. Um, and this is an experiment from Jingxia group at uh, Irvine. Um, uh, for the field, I would like to basically point your attention to, to, these, two, uh, to this plot, these two plots. So for the field perpendicular to the plane, with anti-localization here is clearly observed. This coefficient alpha it's fairly small, nevertheless, so it's even smaller. Uh, so it's, it's small for the field parallel to, to the plane orientation. It's much, much bigger, almost 10 times bigger in the orientation when the field is perpendicular to the plane. So the coefficient, uh, I will address actually what this number should be. I'm just, just click here, I just want to show the main point is that actually this, this effect is seen in some of the six. Uh, an interesting thing, this dependence of the, of the tau phi, or this here is uh, uh, length, phase coherence length, which is basically Fermi velocity times the phase coherence time. The exponent is less than one, so this signifies the ballistic transport. We don't have a diffusive transport, rather ballistic transport, ballistic regime in this case, at least as far as, as, far as tau phi is concerned, which, is, which basically means very high mobility. Uh, of, the, of the surface electron. So there is very recent experiment by uh, J.P. Paglioni's group in Maryland. Here, the things are interesting. Uh, and I just put the comparison for the two. Uh, so uh, for the field perpendicular to the plane configuration, basically, red one is the previous, it's 0 0.92. For J.P.'s result, uh, the J.P. group result is 10 times smaller or so, nine times smaller, I should say. Uh, for the field parallel, uh, JP uh, and his collaborators find 3.8, which is huge. While uh, Irvine is uh, very, very tiny. So there is apparent problem here. So why such a huge distribution of, of, the, of the value of this parameters alpha? And uh, can we actually somehow account for the distribution? And this is the, my main goal, the, the first part of my talk, somehow to uh, understand uh, this behavior. <clears throat> All right, let me quickly introduce the model. Um, so for this first surface state, so generally, I just want to show, this is very general uh, model. It involves two bands of electrons. Uh, there, is a, there is a coupling between them, which is spin orbit-like coupling. This matrix elements are linear and momentum, the right directions. And of course, for the model I want to consider, I want to consider the case when Coulomb interaction between one type of electrode is much bigger than the other, and the bandwidth is inverse proportional to, uh, I mean, the, the, interaction, the relation between the bandwidth is open. So if U, U11 is much bigger than the bandwidth for, the, for this one elect type one electrode is much smaller than the two. Of course, here I basically assume that one one are Fs, and, and two, 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 two the second type is C electrons. So here's the, um, here's the, <coughs> Stabilization elements, they're linear, then you can basically put together the time binding model. Uh, and in the context of Samari MP6, we do this in this paper. Uh, the Hamiltonian will be 8 by 8, um, <coughs> minus 8 by 8. You can put it on the lattice <coughs> later on and, um, and figure out the, the surface space. And this would be done uh, by several actually groups. Um, I'm going to show the results for. Uh, 
paper we've done together with Vitan, who is also in the audience here. Uh, so the answer is this, that you get basically three bands on the surface. We're, we're talking about the surface state structure on the series 01 surface. Uh, below Fermi velocity here actually can be done uh, exactly within the within this mean field model I showed I previously showed to you. The other Fermi velocities actually need to be computed more or less uh, numerically, but uh, there are no surprises here. So we have three bands: uh, elliptic pockets at the x and y, and the circular pocket at gamma. Uh, an interesting thing that this Fermi velocity naturally is proportional to the hybridization matrix element, so it's small. And in principle, you expect the surface electrons to be heavy. That is, the, the Fermi velocity is to be small. And in fact, actually, it has been observed most recently in the NERST experiment uh, by the, the Joe Thompson group in Los Alamos. This is the reference here. Uh, in magneto, in um, quantum oscillations experiments, we see the opposite result for the surface electrons. And I would like to quickly address this issue. And I will also address it towards the end of my talk. Basically, one way to account for it is just to basically do the surface calculation, but uh, with disorder on the surface. And what you find if you start cranking up disorder, again, details can be found in, in our paper, but as soon as you start cranking up disorder, basically what you find is this band bending effect. That is, you pull the bands from the conduction, you start peeling the bands from the conduction balance band into the gap. At one hand, on the other hand, you basically push the Dirac cones inside the balance band, and this is what seems to be observed in some of the Arcus experiments. Uh, and I mean, if your disorder is so violent that basically more or less in gap, in gap what the states are in gap states are mostly are like like electrons. But again, I'd like to make a note: so this seems to be dependent on this specific surface you look at, right? So if you look uh, at uh, surfaces which are perpendicular to the main axis, zero zero one, one zero zero, etc., uh, you typically see predominantly many properties are dominated by the light electrons as opposed to the surfaces along the main diagonals, which seem to be dominated uh, by the uh, Dirac electrons. <coughs> that was the <coughs> So now let me quickly go uh, through the details of the of the uh, of how to, to do the correction to conductivity. Here, I mean, the driving term here, the we have to introduce disorder. We assume that the main effect of disorder is the intraband disorder. That is, it scatters electrons on the same pockets on the surface, right? So now I basically forgot about the bulk. I have three bands on the surface, and I introduce disorder on the surface, which scatters electrons. So my uh, largest time scale on the problem, scattering time scale on the problem, is this intraband scattering, except for tau phi. Tau phi, for time being, I'm just taking it to infinity. And then I have to provide another disorder scattering, which scatters my electrons between the surface, between the pockets. Here I choose uh, all the, uh, this some simple form when, uh, in principle, there are nine versions of disorder you can put in, but ultimately I mean, the results do not change at all, uh, as a matter of fact. So note, I, I'm considering here only uh, disorder which does not break time reversal symmetry, because we basically know what happens if you put magnetic disorder, you will gap out your, um, your conduction mode. So for now, I'm just ignoring it. And uh, basically, the rest is, uh, is known. I mean, uh, you can almost copy-paste the calculation which has been done, for example, for graphene, because it's more closest to, to the calculation we needed to do here for the fact that you have several valleys between, between which electrons can scatter. So and ultimately, uh, we basically, this is the classical conductivity, and we want to find the correction due to the interference effect. So formally, I just show you quickly, you need to solve the battle salpeter equation for this uh, function called the two-particle Higgs function called the Cooperon. Um, physically, it's, it's, uh, it makes sense to actually uh, use the basis which, which has spin singlet, either spin singlet and triplet components. I will explain in a second why it makes sense to do so. Um, <clears throat> and ultimately, you're solving this equation. Why do you need singlet component? Is it because, as I said, when you go around the loops, around the impurities, Basically, the only processes you have are the single processes because you can't be spin up. You will necessarily uh, leave the impurity to spin down and vice versa. So only single component, single mode, basically non-trivial contribution you expect only from single uh, sing scattering in the single channel. And here is one of the main uh, results here. So you have diffusion modes, long range diffusion modes. There are three of them. 
<coughs> and strictly speaking, without intra-band scattering, you will have uh, you will all you will have all of these three modes contributing to conductivity. And uh, I'm just jumping a little bit ahead of time. Alpha, this coefficient should be three halves. So remember, so far we had uh -huh. yeah, alpha should be three halves. <coughs> Uh, but as soon as you introduce interband scattering, you gap out two out of three modes. And it means when you introduce interband scattering, in principle, you have to have alpha to be one half. Now, the key idea of what we did uh, is that if you, after you calculate the, the actual correction to conductivity, uh, it basically has these three forms. Again, you sum over all uh, three modes. You have contributions for three modes. If, if they're all gapless, at the end of the day, alpha will be three halves. If you uh, uh, give two of them out, alpha should be one half. But uh, the point of what I would, uh, would, what I would like to make is that if these gaps are small for some reason, it means that it's some values of the magnetic field, or actually it's some values of temperature, I should say, when tau phi becomes comparable to the remaining modes in the system, uh, to the gap uh, in these modes, Basically, they will start contributing. So when you try to feed experimentally, when you have when you extract the magnetic conductivity, quantum correction to magnetic conductivity, you actually have to be careful as these tails, as for small fields, you effectively have a contribution from only one mole, alpha one half. But when you go to higher fields, all of them, all three of them contribute. And ultimately, this is the main point of, um, uh, I will come back to this later, this is the main point of, for the first part of, of my talk, is that basically, you know, you expect, generally speaking, the distribution for the values of alphas, depending on the temperature, so depending on the tau phi. Because again, the value of the tau phi determines whether you have contribution from the three diffusive modes versus one diffusive mode. So in that sense, we think we more or less can account for this, for, the, for what experimentally, what, what, what being experimentally observed in, uh, in, in the previous experiments, one thing I, I would like to skip it, I just want to uh, say it. So in principle, you <coughs> ask, so what do I expect if you have trivial states, if you have just the, the rush bus split states? The answer is, that the answer uh, was given by Maxim Skvartsov uh, a few years back, and basically the statement is that if you have a um, very large spin orbit coupling, the correction is zero. It, the correction is proportional to uh, conductive quantum interference correction is goes as one over spin orbit coupling uh, times the Fermi times the scattering times to the power three. But in principle, uh, in principle, if you couple trivial states, if you have a situation of coexistence, if you couple trivial states with Dirac states, in principle, you either have one mole, or if the gaps are close, you can also have this crossover <coughs> in the values of alpha. So, the short, to put the long story short, the situation quite actually complicated here as far as the weak anti-localization experiments are concerned. Uh, now let me quickly go into the uh, into the second part, and uh, this is uh, inspired largely by the by the same uh, paper I already mentioned, uh, JP's group, and um, <clears throat> and the story here is that in principle because of the various effects. You might expect that the uh, that the degenerate energy for this point, the rock points on the surface, they will be different. And moreover, uh, if if this is so, you you the chemical potential will be sitting in some position in the gap, which will c c uh, cross the the um, <coughs> two of these pockets, say x and y, at, uh, above the gap, above the Dirac point, the other two below. And now the point is that basically you have the situation when you have two electron bands and one Dirac band and one pole band, and uh, with such a spectrum where velocities are different and energies are different. Now the statement is that as soon as you introduce interaction between the two, you know you cannot avoid that they will interact with each other, and there are basically the generic form is given here. Uh, you inevitably hit the situation when uh, um, you can develop what's called the excitonic body parameter. I want to mention quickly that this physics, which is very close to what I'm talking, is, has been discussed recently by Pitan and uh, his collaborators, um, but the, what they sort of hasn't been discussed is the possibility of developing special inhomogeneous state. They talked about pneumatic, very special type of pneumatic state. Uh, let me just 
since I'm almost running out of time, <clears throat> I just would like to mention that in the context of Samadhi of the Six, and uh, generally it's in the context of exuberance, uh, this topic has been discussed uh, as a possible origin of weak uh, ferromagnetism in these materials, but the physics is the same. You have multiple bands, electron and hole like interaction between them will drive to excitonic instability, and uh, you can actually write the dependence uh, of the critical temperature in the case when there is a mismatch between the Fermi surfaces. So you might have a mismatch between the velocities and also between the number of uh, carriers in your system. And it turns out this mismatch basically pushes the critical temperature of the excitonic transition down. And you can find the criteria for that. Uh, and what makes the job easier is that you can almost map exactly the uh, um, the mean field theory for the Dirac electrons to the mean field theory for the usual uh, uh, trivial square, uh, trivial electrons. So the point I'm trying to make is that you see here that the critical temperature at some at some range of uh, um, parameters, mismatch parameters actually becomes higher. And moreover, this is the case of a single field. So in principle, there are solutions inside here, for the, again, for the certain range of the, uh, of the mismatch, when you can have generate a solution with multiple uh, momenta. And uh, because of that, you expect naturally existence of domains that your, your density basically being dependent on several momenta means that your density basically somehow fluctuates as you go through, as you probe the surface at different points. Uh, and the same, again, these ideas has been around, has been discussed in the context of, as I mentioned, exabarites, has been discussed in the context of, um, of ionic type superconductors. <clears throat> but two features which you expect is that you expect quasi one dimensional transport, because if you have domains, inside the domains, the, 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 the single particle excitations are kept out, so the only, the only states which can carry current are I and the H. And the other thing that here you necessarily have a first order transition, so expect the <coughs> behavior as in if you tune, if the system is tuned somewhere in this region. All right, um, this is mostly, I'm just putting it up for discussion. I decided rather than um, uh, providing again the summary of the results I had, I would just put this, uh, this point and I'm, um, yeah, I look forward to your questions, but before I do that, I'm sorry, I forgot a very important thing. I'm later. So I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, right? So uh, the quantum transport, this has been done together with Kosti Kicheja, who is now in Ames Lab, Maxim Vavilov in Wisconsin, Victor Belitsky in Maryland, and also we've done the calculation of the Nernst effect related to this, uh, but I benefited greatly from discussions with Alex, who is now in Wisconsin Medicine, and super, uh, the story of the uh, Samari B6 is continuing, and I'm working on it with my students, Helen and uh, Mark at, at Kent State. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs> so the paper is now open for uh, discussion. And so it starts so, there. I, I want to make first a comment, and that's only for our results from Michigan. We have been looking at uh, weak ants localization or have been trying to see it and, and you know going over lots of samples everything we see is not reproducible on our end and, and we have dynamic features some of which might be arising from indium and other things we don't we don't know our features are intrinsic or not uh, uh, but but when we sweep sufficiently slowly uh, whatever we see disappears so so that's sort of a mystery for you know that that, and, that and may I ask you what surface did you look uh, at? We looked at one 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 zero one zero zero. I see and we did we did it for both uh, you know from to, from Britain and and uh, Irvine. Uh -huh. uh, so so we did see <coughs> reproducible features in our case. So so um, so the second this is a comment and and this is going to be probably discussed. Uh, the second is is. Um, we are always suspicious of, or at least for a year now, suspicious of the uh, native oxide uh, having, uh, you know, providing magnetic impurities. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the question is, if some percentage of the scattering is, is coming from yeah. magnetic impurities, 
what would the theoretical yeah. uh, picture be in, no, in, in your culture? That, yeah. that is the, the first one was a comment. This is a question. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, just while I'm thinking to how to answer your question, I would like to mention a very important thing. So if you if I didn't cite your work, I deeply apologize. No, no, just, no, no, no. no, no. It's just to everyone. No, no, no. This is something yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not But the question, the uh, question, uh, yes. We, the, we've the, been trying to observe uh, the sure. localization. This question has been addressed. Problem. This question has been addressed in the context of biscuit-based materials, <laughs> when, when you have both channels of scattering. And if your, um, if your uh, magnetic scattering is big enough, that is relative to, uh, basically it's relative to the Fermi energy. That, I mean, we always mm -hmm. assume that we have a finite chemical potential. So you will have a crossover from weak anti-localization to localization. So in some field, you will have to, you will, your correction should become positive. That's an answer. So uh, now to which field you can go to where, to see this crossover? That's of course the question of the microscopic parameters in this theory. But the top of the hand answer is that you must you must have a crossover between the two regimes. Yeah. Yes, please. But even if you don't go to that crossover regime, that means your peak can be lower and you can overest underestimate alpha in that case. No, yeah, that's uh, that's sort of what I try to emphasize. There are many ways by which you can overestimate or underestimate the value of the parameter alpha. Even in this sort of simple and very basic theory, right? You have combination of the scattering factors and diffusion coefficients that you can get ultimately anything you want. It, even if we disregard for a moment that you, you can also have trivial states which couple you to your uh, non-trivial conduction channels, right, etc. So it's indeed, it, at least as far as weak localization is concerned, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to interpret and, um, and analyze. Uh, I just have one comment and one question. Okay, so the comment is that the weak anti-localization in fact is very sensitive to magnetic purity. You can have a trace amount of serum, for example, 0.01%. Instead of weak anti-localization, you'll see Congo effect on the surface state. So the surface becomes a, uh, a, a basically a metallic state with Congo scattered. And instead of uh, this weak anti-localization, you see the, the Congo temperature behavior. Uh, so that, that means that you, there, there are samples that there are only some of the samples that will show weak anti-localization. So that's one. And the other is uh, actually a uh, similar question for you. So you suggested that it might be a coexisting direct and a trivial conduction state, right? So for the trivial conduction state, if you don't increase non magnetic impurity, you should be able to see eventually at a variable temperature the uh, localization effect. Is that uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't suggest, I mean, I suggested it because it's, it becomes, so it hangs in the air, right? So I mean, when we talk between each other, so at least the people I talk to. Somehow this topic of coexistence comes up. Uh, but I would like to just slide, go back uh, quickly to, the, uh, to this slide which I didn't show. Um, here it is. So this is, the, this is a trivial, right? So this is when we have sp two spin basically two spin orbit cup, uh, spin orbit split bands. And this is what you will have for the correction to the conductivity. So as a function of this parameter x is spin orbit times Fermi times the transport time tau. This is transport, not tau fine here. So when you see here, if this spin orbit is big enough, you necessarily cross over from localization to anti-localization, and then you basically die out here, right? But this is for pure, just trivial state. Now, as soon as you couple non-trivial to trivial, you necessarily open the gap, because by time reversal symmetry, you're, all, you're always allowed to have a single diffusion mode. But you have other gaps now, and with these gaps might become important depending on what temperature your, your experiment is there. But ultimately, if you go at very, very low temperatures, such as your tau phi is huge, you, you have to have only alpha equals to half. There is no way out. No matter how many conduction channels you have, for infinite phase, co phase uh, coherence time, you must have only one diffusion mode propagating. And that's alpha half. So um, I have a couple of questions slash comments. First, the uh, issue of localization versus anti-localization in the presence of slash absence of value scattering is a rather subtle question experimentally. Even in graphene, it's not really subtle. And graphene is a, a pure material. Now, there are people who claim it's subtle, but I know it's not subtle because I have talked to many different experimentalists. And, and basically, you can make any claim you want depending on whose data you're looking at. Because it's a difficult question. You can always invoke back intervalic scattering, but if it works or it doesn't work, you say it's not there. 
And so it doesn't matter what we see. It's a very subtle question, so one needs to be careful. And, you know, if fear is fine, but second thing is that I missed something in your talk. I'm sure it's in there that I was not fully paying proper attention. What is the Arshuna that I don't know? I mean, I mean, is that included or not? No, 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 no. Yeah, all happens what it. happens when you have electron-electron interaction. Correct. So you let that there are No, yeah, because this is, goes to tau phi and other stories. Oh, so, so this you is know, electron, electron, that's not present. Exactly, yeah. And this that's is the complicated things in general, again, interpreting experiments. Exactly, okay. exactly, yeah, right. yeah. But this is, this now, is, uh, my this is a question, which is the most trivial question. I'm just trying to understand through the transport in this system. You are talking about very small correction to this through the transport, yeah. which becomes very large as temperature becomes very small. Yeah. Is there a good understanding of through the transport? Do you understand, for example, what the transport gap people see and, uh, you know, uh -huh. bulk and surface? Is that all understood? It's temperature dependence, it's uh, no, there is it's no density dependence, all these other things? Uh, I can answer that. Right, please. This is yes. because I'm interested. So, okay. so we've been spending two years trying to figure out the carrier density right. and mobility, right. and 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 come to Steve Walter's right. talk. And the the more the the, the the smoother we make the samples, the higher the resistance becomes. Yeah. So we are cornering the carrier density and mobility uh, in the parameter mm -hmm. space. It appears to be. The small are actually probably even smaller than the X pocket in some of the cases, and and the mobility is around 120, 130, mm -hmm. and we know a lot of the earlier samples that we had, you know, the fraction of the current that was flowing on the surface was was some small fraction of the whole current. There is a lot of current flowing in the, the subsurface cracks, so so. So, so we are trying to corner this, and, and, and if we can't corner it, then, then right. every, so every parameter we're right. going to get is right. going to be so zero. If you have zero thought at all, <coughs> large yes. error bar, is I error think this is not time to talk about uh, weak yes. interference effect. That will come, you know, yes. five to ten years after we have figured no, out. No, not five to ten years. We think we are getting really close, but when, when we started, we started with the uh, uh, you know, R squared in the uh, 10, 20 ohms, and then now we are in the two, two, 3 kilo ohm R squared. So R, I mean, we, we think we corner the parameter space. So even the fog, we give R versus P, may show two gaps. Yeah. And the gap is much smaller than that. Typically. <laughs> Not that much smaller. Well, that, that is an issue that still floats through the, the literature, that optics uh, actually sees evidence for two gaps, uh, one three or four millivolts and one more like 20. Uh, photo emission seems to see 20. Um, the, the transport would seem to suggest three or four millivolts for, for the bulk gap. So we can't blame the activated bulk conductivity on the surface states because there aren't enough electrons to activate the bulk. So, so what, what's activating the bulk conductivity? I don't think it's across the full 20 millivolt gap. It's just difficult to, at least by traditional simple Cattell-like thinking, get the chemical potential high enough up to three or four millivolts. Uh, and, and yeah, with the difference in the degeneracies of the valence and conduction band. So I would say we don't have that under control. Yeah, this is one of the kind of zero thought or more. Right. You have to distinguish a direct gap, that's the one you measure with the circuit, and an indirect gap, that is, you get by two optics. They are very, they're very uh, Fair enough. That's, that's a possibility. Other questions? If not, then let's thank the speaker again.